officially launching this third Thursday trek and would encourage all of you to go ahead and hit your, uh, your silent button, your mute button. And um, as we kind of roll into this and would also encourage you to go up maybe and put your view on speaker view. And that will allow some of us to do some screen sharing as we go along here. Um, we're trying a few different things. Some of you have been part of our third Thursday treks over the past couple of months. The first one we did was to Syria and Lebanon. And then last month we went to Egypt and the third of the series, not necessarily the last of the third Thursday treks we hope, but at least of this three part series um, is to Cuba and everyone has been different. Um, and everyone, has had a very important component of it, and that is to invite one or several of our partners from Egypt um, to share in the message of what is going on in that place, and even more specifically to share in an invitation to consider visiting in that place, but even beyond that, since not everyone can travel to the places Outreach Foundation goes, an opportunity to know about and pray about and care about our extended family around the world. And in this particular case, um, we are headed to Cuba. Um, I am going to do a, a longer, more um, extensive introduction of my co-host for this event, Carlos Emilio Ham, a little bit later, but it would be remiss of me not to mention him and ask him to bring a greeting. Reverend Carlos Emilio Ham, the Reverend Dr. Carlos Emilio Ham is the president of the seminary of Matanzas, which is one of the two partners, main partners of the Outreach Foundation. The other partner in Cuba is the Independent Presbyterian Reformed Church in Cuba. And Carlos actually has dual loyalties, we might say, <clears throat> because not only is he the president of the seminary, but he is a pastor of the Independent Presbyterian Reformed Church in Cuba and actually pastors a congregation in addition to being the president of the seminary, which we're gonna talk much more about. But Carlos, please bring some a greeting to us and then we'll have you um, speak in a little bit longer, a little bit later on. Yes, well, with pleasure. Uh, thank you, uh, Marilyn, for organizing this uh, trip very exciting trip to Cuba, which I hope will help you to open your appetite in order to come to see us physically um, when uh, COVID allows us. So with pleasure on behalf of our Protestant uh, uh, Ecumenical Seminary, Theological Seminary in Cuba, and also on behalf of the Presbyterian Reformed Church in Cuba, I greet you very warmly and thank you for your interest and thank you for your support in our scenario. Thank you, dear Carlos. And we're gonna be hearing much more from Carlos um, in just a minute, but I am gonna go ahead and um, share with you to start out. And if you'll just give me a chance to kind of pull up the beginning here of a presentation. And assuming all of you can see this, and once again, if you go up into the upper right-hand corner and minimize everything but my smiling face, and if you will make sure that your audio is off, that will be helpful as well. And one of the things to emphasize, and I know all of you have become veterans at doing these kind of Zoom conversations, would invite you over the course of our time, over this brief hour that we're together, to go into the chat room and as questions come to you to please put them in there. 
Kelly Rickard, who is also one of the co-hosts on this call, is very competently working behind the scenes for the Outreach Foundation. She is our Director of Communication. She'll be taking those questions in, kind of consolidating them, um, and then that, that is something that both, both Carlos and I can look at um, as we leave time at the end to do it. One of the things that I learned from doing the first Third Thursday Trek is one of the comments was, please show a map and don't assume that we know where everything is in the world. And so um, I'm just going to start with this map. And one of the reasons why I love this map is that if you see the island of Cuba and you go literally just a few miles north to the top, whoops, sorry, I just went out of there, you'll see the tip of Florida, the tip of the USA. Florida and Cuba almost you can almost see one another. You can't. There's about 70 miles as the crow flies. What should be a close working relationship, a close family relationship between these two nations, um, of course, has been made distant through decades of political um, rancor between our two nations. And we pray that there will soon be a time where things have evened out, where it's much easy to communicate, to travel to between these two nations. But suffice it to say, for people of faith, we have always found a way to make our way to Cuba long before the door was more open, where there were direct flights as there are now, there was always a way to make our way to Cuba. In the early days when I first started traveling there in 2020, it required um, a very complex license from the Treasury Department. Now it is much easier to do it. But just two little brief points on that map um, at you're aware of. Havana, of course, the capital of Cuba is a place everybody knows about, but you will soon know much more about the city directly to the right of Havana or to the east as you look at the map, the city of Matanzas, which is the city where Carlos Emilio Ham, my co-host in this event, is sitting. And as I said, you're going to meet him in just a minute. One of the things that we have tried to do with this third Thursday trek is not to just focus on kind of the, the, the academic, I might say, or the intellectual kind of the meeting of the church in these places, you will certainly meet the church and the Christian presence of uh, in Cuba, but to also give you a flavor for what it's like to travel there in some places focusing on the historic sites in a place like Egypt. And when I took people to Lebanon, we talked about the food and the coffee. When I think of sort of the visceral experience of Cuba for me, I think of Cuba and its soundtrack. Cuba is a place of color and art and sound, and that sound expresses itself in music. I discovered in looking through my files that I had so many short little videos that involve music. And I thought, wow, this is maybe a great way to create a beginning for people to get a feel of the flavor and the diversity of Cuba. But also, as I said, to have in your ear what Cuba sounds like when you go there. And so I have five short little snippets that I'm going to share with you. The soundtrack of Cuba, according to Marilyn Bors, beginning with a classic um, sort of a, a band, a mariachi band, we might say, encountered on a rest stop between Havana and Matanzas. So let me just play a little bit of the sound of that for you. <laughs> So friends, that's one sound of Cuba. Here's a second sound that is Cuba to me. And Ralph, you might recognize this one because I think we encountered this one together when Ralph was part of the Outreach Foundation team a couple of years ago to Cuba. We were staying in the little town of Remedios, 
where there is a, a Presbyterian church, by the way, and as Ralph and I would go out early in the morning, he to run, me to walk, we would encounter as the sun was coming up, the bells ringing from the Catholic church in the town square. Foundation, of course, our focus is always primarily upon connecting with our family of faith in that place. And so to turn the corner toward the sound that is greets your ears, even within our Presbyterian churches in Cuba, um, a little snippet of a Sunday morning joyful beginning to worship led by the pastor who you will see in just a minute, um, Reverend Adelberto Valdez, who is a gregarious pastor of the IPRC. He also happens to be the general secretary of the church right now and has a pretty good rhythm, as you will know, is unabashed about singing and moving his body and encouraging his congregation to do so as well. Our team was there. You'll see some of my outreach foundation team as I make my way to the back of the church on that bright summer Sunday morning. Well, there you have kind of an impromptu sound of music. One of the most moving musical experiences I have ever had in Cuba is one that I've had on multiple occasions traveling to Cuba. Because in the city of Matanzas, there resides one of the premier international professional choral groups that, um, not only performs in Cuba, but literally around the world. They are called the Decamera de Matanzas, the, the working group, the works of, of Matanzas. They are an incredible choral society, a cappella, that the first time I heard them, I burst into tears. I could not believe what I was hearing in Cuba. I had no expectation for the professionalism the sublimity, we might say, of this group. And this performance, by the way, is taking place in the chapel of Matanza Seminary. And often when we are in residence there, the seminary, the choir, this, this professional choir comes to sing for us. And you'll hear just a little bit of the sublime. For those of you who are in choir, you would recognize um, Randall Thompson's Alleluia. <laughs> And one last part of the soundtrack of Cuba for me that I want to share with you is also here at 
the seminary of Matanzas where our friend Carlos Emilio Ham is the president. And it once again is, is early morning. That's the chapel in the distance. I'm out walking the grounds early in the morning. And the day begins on the seminary campus with beautiful music being broadcast over the campus through the loudspeaker system. And I was thankfully had my camera and caught this moment to share with you. A wonderful way to start the day on the, on the seminary campus. And by the way, whenever we travel to Cuba, as some of you who have been with me know, um, we stay on the seminary campus for a number of days. The seminary built many uh, years ago a, a wonderful kind of a multi-purpose dormitory facility that not only houses the students when they come for additional training or for remote learning, students who have been learning remotely come to campus, but it also functions as guest quarters for teams like ours that we can stay right there on the campus. We eat with the students, we worship with them at their chapel. We'll talk a little bit more about the, the seminary in just a minute, but a quick, um, a, a quick glimpse into the life of the church in Cuba when Outreach Foundation travels. Our time is spent, as I said, with our seminary partners, but also with congregations congregations that are large like Central Presbyterian Church here, also in the city of Matanzas where it's Pastor Ari, um, um, as you see on the left, his wife Beatty, both of them by the way are pastors of the Independent Presbyterian Reformed Church in Cuba. They have a large downtown congregation that is filled with lively fellowship with a burgeoning youth program with Bible studies on Sunday morning where literally every square inch of the church is packed with a group that is studying God's word. One of the remarkable ministries of the church in Matanzas, which is also true in every congregation that I have met with in Cuba, is an incredible ministry with the elderly. It's one of the outreach caring ministries of the church. Carlos can talk a little bit more about that, of why this is such an important part of the ministry of the church. Central Presbyterian is a large church, but we also encounter in the small villages of, the, of, of um, Cuba, incredible faith and faithfulness. I talked about two pastors there of Ari and Beatty, but a reminder that when the revolution began in Cuba, 70% of the pastors left, and those who were left behind to lead were often the lay leaders and elders of the church who carried on the leadership of the church, like Mercedes Cardenas, who you see here, one of my favorite people on the planet. When I this picture was taken in 2018, she was 89 years old. She's now in her early 90s. And Carlos assures me she is still growing, going strong, leading the church in little village like this. This is the village of Sabania 
The town square of Sabania, by the way, is where Mercedes, who did not have a faith life, first heard the gospel preached when she was a child. An evangelist who came into the town square began to share the good news. And from that evangelist, the first Presbyterian congregation was born in that place. A long history during the revolution, most of the people, most of the Christians left. Mercedes stayed behind to see the church rebuilt. She is still there to welcome those who want to hear of God's faithfulness, which is perceived for me through the faithfulness of people like Elder Mercedes. Well, now to pivot and to welcome more into this conversation, Reverend Carlos Emilio Ham, here this beautiful view of Matanzas Bay, this peaceful place of learning and restoration is how I would describe Matanzas Seminary, where young people are equipped for mission and ministry. It is an ecumenical seminary, as Carlos will talk about, serving not just Presbyterians, but other denomination, but the Presbyterians are one of the founding fathers or mothers, we might say, of this place. And this wonderful church, by the way, this wonderful gathering of, of young people who were at studying at that time, the two people that you see on the far left there, this young woman in the blue shirt and the young man next to her, by the way, Roxy and Fernando, Will, would fall in love, would get married. In fact, there's Reverend Beatty performing their ceremony. I think this was in December of 2019, just a little bit of the magic that happens in this wonderful place of solace and learning that is the seminary of Matanzas. And leading that seminary is our good friend of the Outreach Foundation, a scholar, a pastor of the church, but also someone who has had an incredible footprint in the larger Christian family of faith. When I first met Carlos, by the way, it was back in 2000 on my very first trip to Cuba. I would later encounter him in, of all places, a Greek Orthodox church in Damascus. Because what I didn't, and we both looked across the room at each other, and I said, Carlos, and he said, Marilyn, we were both puzzled to find ourselves in that place. I was traveling, of course, with for, at that time, Peachtree Presbyterian Church. Carlos was there part of a, a dozen of years he spent serving in Europe for World Council of Churches as their associate for mission and evangelism. And then our paths would cross again as we, as he came back to Cuba, I continued to come to Cuba and the rest, as they say, is God's working out our history together. So I want to invite Carlos to unmute himself, to share with us a little bit of the mission and ministry of the seminary, what is going on with the church at this time. And as I said, feeling free as you all do to, add, to put some questions in the chat room. And if we have time, we also have a video of the seminary that we're gonna share with you. But Carlos, go ahead and unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about how God is at work in Cuba right now. Well, thank you, Marilyn, once again for organizing this uh, trip to Cuba. Uh, how many hours can I speak now? Because I have a lot to say. 20 minutes we give you. 20 minutes, okay. No, no, I, I, won't, I won't speak that long. Um, yes, well, first of all, and thank you for, for your, I'm very impressed with the way in which you inform and share information about Cuba. It's a good thing that, that the video camera only takes here our bus because otherwise you would have seen my feet dancing <laughs> with the beautiful, good. with the great Cuban music. Yeah. Yes, well, um, uh, our seminary, uh, the, the official name is Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary in Matanzas. Uh, many of you know the term evangelical for us in Spanish does not mean exactly what it means for you in English. Uh, for us, evangelical is synonym of Protestant. 
So that means that our seminary is one of the first Protestant seminaries that was founded in Cuba in 1946. That means that we are celebrating this year 75 years of uninterrupted ministry. And I like to underline uninterrupted because um, at the beginning of the revolution in the 1960s, um, when, as Marilyn said, we lost all these amount of pastors because of the um, atheist regime, uh, we had very few students at that time. Uh, in fact, when I studied here in the 1980s, we were only four students, mm -hmm. out of which two of them were from, from Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, we hardly had any vocational um, <clears throat> commitment from the youth because uh, people felt that Cuba did not have, uh, th there were no future for the churches in Cuba. Uh, so um, the seminary was founded also uh, from the very beginning as an ecumenical seminary. That means that we have around um, uh, 15 historically established theological seminaries and ours is the only ecumenical one, which means that it, our board is formed by four then different denominations our own church, the Presbyterian Reform, also the Episcopalian, the Fraternity of Baptist Churches and the Quakers. But we have had students throughout all these years um, of more than 40 or 50 different denominations and even people of other religions and even atheists and agnostics, no? So this situation um, in the first 30 years of the revolution, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, uh, in, 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 in many years, we did not have any graduates. Again, because what I mentioned, no, because of the atheist regime, and, 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 and therefore we didn't have any students, but the seminary never closed. The different principals, different presidents managed to keep the seminary always open organizing national or international uh, events, symposiums, also receiving delegations like the one that Marilyn has explained from the Outreach Foundation and other churches. But then the situation changed uh, 180 degrees in the last 30 years of the Cuban Revolution when the uh, Berlin Wall collapsed in 1989. Uh, we went through a major change in our country, which means that our state, even when it's still a socialist state, is no longer uh, atheist officially. Uh, so that, that meant that in that um, decade of the 1990s, we had a tremendous church revival and in direct proportion, we had a new great influx of students. So out of, for example, four students that we were in the 1980s, we have now around 500 uh, different uh, students uh, in, in, in our seminary. So therefore, we, we have gone through that dramatic uh, situation, which has meant a tremendous um, challenge for us because the reason of the existence of our seminary is precisely to serve the churches uh, in their capacity building for their pastoral, pastors and for their different ministries. And since the situation in Cuba is so transforming and changing so rapidly, that means that we also need to adjust our curricula uh, in order to meet the needs of our, um, of our churches, member churches. At the same time, uh, our seminary also um, uh, carries out what we call diaconal projects, projects to serve the people. I, I was surprised, Marilyn, that you didn't show the picture of our of our garden, of our, how do you call it? The, the food, food garden, no? 
which is be, behind the chapel that you showed, no? We, um, we, we raise vegetables, et cetera, which we help in the community. And also we have a very uh, important uh, system of uh, water, uh, filtering of water, which was installed 11 years ago here by um, the uh, Living Waters for the World. And in fact, the seminary, our seminary is, I would say the host. Now we have up to 60, six zero uh, water systems that we help to organize and to install and to, and to maintain. Well, I think in general terms, that's what I can share. And then, uh, uh, of course, I'm, I'm open to, to many questions or to the questions that you might have. Carlos, this might be, if we can get that film, Kelly um, Rickard, we have a wonderful film to share with you. It's seven minutes in length, but it's a wonderful kind of a, an in-depth um, look at the seminary. And um, you'll hear Carlos in it. And um, one of the kind of, the, this was a film that was put together by the Presbyterian Foundation of the PCUSA. And it's a beautiful film. Tom Taylor, um, who is a good friend of the Outreach Foundation is narrating it. And hopefully we can get that up because it's so professionally done. Um, and if we do see it, you will note some interviews with some of the students in it. All of those students are now in places of pastoral ministry, but if you just kind of think in the back of your mind, you'll meet a, a young man by the name of Fernando, who is kind of fair haired, kind of, um, kind of slight. Um, he is, uh, came out of the First Presbyterian Church of Havana to the seminary. You'll meet a young man by the name of Dargel, who will tell the story of coming out of a life of no faith and being introduced to the Presbyterian Church and finding Christ and making his way to the seminary. And then you'll meet Adriana, who was an elder in the Presbyterian Church, the wife of a pastor, before she herself felt the call to, to ministry. And, and Carlos can give us an update, but Kelly, let's see if we can bring that film up. So be, be patient with us here as we try our... All right, I'm gonna try and bring that up, can you? Hear me, here we go. Share that over. And that should do it. Excellent. For many of us, the name Cuba evokes thoughts of the communist revolution in 1959 or the missile crisis under President John F. Kennedy. Others may think of the glamour days when the rich and famous vacationed here enjoying the culture, the sun, the music, and the cigars that this island is famous for. But what few may know is that the Presbyterian Church has had a deep and enduring presence here for more than 120 years, even during all the years of the revolution. And these Presbyterian congregations here today are thriving. During the first 30 years of the revolution, it was quite difficult for the churches to carry out their mission. There was a subtle type of discrimination against the different Christians. That was my own experience. I was two years old when uh, the revolution triumphed. My father was a Cuban pastor. My mother was an American missionary. And we were raised in that, let's say, atheist environment. Yo nací en una familia revolucionaria, comunista, atea, donde hablar de Dios no era algo concebido. Eh, yo no conocía nada ni de la Biblia, ni de Jesucristo. Nunca había escuchado nada de que tuviera que ver con una iglesia. Pero eh, con 15 años, uno, los amiguitos de, del barrio comenzaron a visitar eh, la iglesia presbiteriana entonces eh, me invitan y yo fui a un estudio bíblico en navidad me presentaron a un hombre que yo no conocía que se llamaba Jesús así conocía al Señor y esos fueron mis primeros pasos dentro de la iglesia we understand that people are very much thirsty here in Cuba and they want to learn more about 
um, the Bible, about God, about his spirituality. Uh, and uh, people, they look for these opportunities to start reading the Bible and participating in the Bible studies in the houses and, and even going to church as well. So there is a, a huge movement of the spirit throughout the island in terms of people getting more and more, gaining more and more interest uh, in the spiritual things. The Evangelical Theological Seminary of Matanzas, Cuba is at the center of church life. For over 70 years, the seminary has trained pastors and other church leaders for the many very active congregations on the island. The philosophy of our seminary is the integration of theory and practice which means that from Monday to Friday, they receive the theoretical academic classes per se. And also over the weekends, the churches send them to the different local parishes. Soñamos con que esta escuela sea una escuela que, eh, sobre todo, que responda a las necesidades de la iglesia cubana. Pastores con ministros bien preparados, pero sobre todo insertados, muy bien insertados en la realidad cubana y el contexto cubano. If you can imagine, about 80% of those attending Presbyterian churches in Cuba are brand new believers. And the faith is growing fastest among teenagers and young adults, many of whom have already expressed a clear interest in church leadership as pastors, youth leaders, musicians, and in other roles. Y hay una frase muy popular en Cuba que dice que la juventud está perdida. Pero yo, yo, yo tengo mucha esperanza en Dios y pienso que los jóvenes no solo somos el futuro, sino también somos el presente. Y, y ha sido una experiencia muy linda, muy linda de, de renovación, de entrega, de, de servicio, de vocación, de sentir que puedo hacer mucho más por, por la iglesia. No solo el pastoral y, la, y, y, su, y su asignatura, ¿no? Es el, con su excelente trabajo en hacerme repensar en mi fe, sino también el trabajo en la iglesia local, me hicieron ver más allá de lo que yo quería o pensaba que podía ser. Y es así como yo acá. Y pienso que si la iglesia de los primeros siglos, los padres de la iglesia tuvieron esperanza de que la iglesia de ser reprimida pasara a una iglesia abierta y que estuviera en todo el mundo y en todas las naciones, pienso que nosotros tenemos esperanza y fe en el Señor de que la juventud va a seguir estando ahí, va a seguir trabajando y sirviendo para la gloria de Dios y para la iglesia. The churches in the 1990s, at the beginning of the new millennium, started to grow tremendously. And as a direct result, we started to have a new influx of students in our seminary. To the extent that, for example, we were only four students that graduated in the seminary, and now we have around 500 students in our different programs. This kind of growth is incredibly exciting, but it's also very challenging because it creates the need for new well-trained church leadership, as well as the construction and upkeep of church facilities, many of which are used almost every day for these rapidly growing congregations and the communities that they serve. The Cuban Church and the Presbyterian Church in USA have been in partnership for many, many yes. years. Right. Um, when relationships broke with the governments, that partnership was also tenuous. But the churches continued to uh, mm -hmm. seek fellowship and understanding, um, even through those very difficult times. The Cubans often say that by having these relationships, they realize they're not alone, even though they may have been isolated through some of these years, the, the connection through the church is what's been constant. This work in the seminary is a joyful and hopeful work. It helps us to see with optimism, even when things are not so clear, and things are not so certain. It is an opportunity always to be certain that even when we don't know what the future holds, we know who holds the future. There is a church in Cuba. It's a faithful church. It's a working church. It's a church serving the community. It's a church that has been in trouble in the past, and they survive, and they will be faithful and trying to model to the Cuban country what it means to be the kingdom of God. 
If you or your church would like to get involved, partnering with this beautifully fertile place of Christian mission and join in the amazing work that God is doing in Cuba, please contact us today. And thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for queuing that up. I'm pleased that that worked. Um, a beautiful film. And I love what Tom Taylor says at the end of, of visiting of this beautifully fertile place for mission and ministry. And that has always been what I come away with, um, as well as the deep impression that I have of the faithfulness of the church in a not easy place because of the circumstances there. Um, Carlos, um, in addition to being the president of the seminary, you are also a pastor of a local congregation. Tell us a little bit about your congregation and how your work directly in the church influences your, your job and your call as the president of training other pastors. Yes, uh, thank you, Marilyn, for the question. Uh, as I mentioned in the interview, in the video, I mentioned that the philosophy of our uh, teaching system here in our theological seminary is to combine theory with uh, practice. So that means that our students come and they spend five days a week here, and then they spend the weekends in a particular congregation assigned not by the seminary, but by their respective churches, which means that our seminary works very closely related to the churches. Now, for us as, as professors here in the seminary, I think the same way that the students have that experience of combining theory and practice, it's important for us as professors to have that experience as well. In order to understand better and to make sure that whatever we teach and whatever we share has uh, a direct uh, grounding in the experience of our Cuban people. And I think, as you mentioned in your question, the best way to experience that is to be a pastor in the congregation, to see which are the challenges, which are the needs, which are not only spiritual, but also material and therefore to try to accompany people in their struggle for life, like this situation in which we're living now. So I, I appreciate, appreciate that I can also exercise not only a vocation of administration, of uh, teaching, but also a pastoral vocation among the, the people, among the flock. Indeed. You know, Carlos, um, and for the benefit of, of the people who are listening in and watching and um, some of who have been on these trips to Cuba, others who may be contemplating it, the way that we structure um, these trips is these two components, as I mentioned early on, and that is time spent with one of our two partners there, which is the seminary and we days literally living on the campus, integrating with the life of the seminary, with the students in this beautiful place. But then the rest of the time is spent visiting congregations of the Independent Presbyterian Church in Cuba. And there are many, way too many to see on one trip. And so we um, go to different parts of the island on different trips. There are three presbyteries that make their way from the far west of the island all the way to the middle of the island. There's a lot of geography and sometimes we cover all three presbyteries, but they are places where we are welcomed as family that we are. And I, I want to kind of make a link back to for Carlos to update us because three of the students that you saw in that video, which of course was filmed a, a number of years ago, maybe three or four years, four years ago or more, those students are now all in places of ministry. And Carlos, give us a quick update of, of where and how Fernando and Adriana and Dargel, uh, Dargel are now serving in Cuba. Yes, well, uh, in spite of the fact that these three students are coming from other presbyteries, as you mentioned in the introduction, Marilyn, 
the three of them are working in the central presbytery, which is the presbytery, if you remember the map of Cuba, and thank you for showing Marilyn the map, um, it's more towards the central part of the island, towards the east of, of Havana. So Adriana, who, as you mentioned, is an elder, an ordained elder. By the way, we have the same ordination between elders and pastors. That means that she is already ordained. She only, she only needs to be commissioned as a pastor. Mm -hmm. She is serving as a pastor in one of our biggest congregations, which is Santo Espiritus. It's one of the uh, churches that you showed in your, in your presentation with the um, uh, ringing of the bells. Mm -hmm. um, and they have, she works also in two different missions that belong to that church in Santi Spiritus, which means Holy Spirit, not, <laughs> not in Spanish, but in Latin yeah. language. Then Fernando is in Tawasco, married with Roxana. As you saw in the picture, one of the pictures of Marilyn, they got married here. That's one of the interesting things of the seminary, no? That many people, uh, many students leave not only with a, a academic degree, but also with a spouse, which is lovely. And since this is an ecumenical seminary, it's very interesting to see the, the inter-denominational uh, uh, mixture that we have also among the couples. So they are both, she is a Quaker, Roxana is a Quaker and Fernando is from the Presbyterian Church. They are serving in a church called Tahuasco, which is close to Santo Espíritus. And uh, Darhel, uh, who is also married to a pastor, Yailen. Yailen, Yailen is serving in Sagua La Grande and Darhel in Calabazar de Sagua, which is about 30 minutes drive from Sagua, no? And, and even when uh, we uh, send them out to the churches with their degrees, we always keep in touch. I mentioned to them that I was going to have this meeting with you through Zoom. They send their greetings. They send their love and appreciation because they know very well that many of you uh, contributed supporting their scholarships and through also through your prayers, which are not less important. Uh, I sent uh, Marilyn some updated photos of their current ministry. I don't know if you, if you can show them now, Marilyn. Uh, you know, I can try um, real quick and see if I can pull that up. Hold on a minute. Um, I'd like to think that I'm, you know, I'm as, um, hold on a minute. I may be able to do it. Are you all seeing it? I think you are seeing it. Let me go. Oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. So here is um, here is um, where Dargel is serving. This is Calabazar de Sawa, um, and here you see him with his congregation. I think this is this is Dargel right here, right, Carlos? Yes, correct. Off to the far left, you can see it's a, a wonderful kind of multi generational congregation. Um, here you see um, Sweet Fernando. Um, who is serving in Tawasco, and, um, and here's a, a picture that he sent visiting some of the elderly in the community, and here, I'm not sure what he's doing here, but I suspect that it's a Presbyterian committee, because doesn't it look like a Presbyterian committee meeting? They're identifiable anywhere you go around the world. Um, yes, and I, I'm sorry, but excuse me, moving back to the previous one, uh, where you saw the previous, please, uh, there he is, uh, the, the many of our, there you go, many of our congregations have uh, uh, food, food ministries, particularly for the elderly, who are the ones that are going through more um, uh, suffering, more the critical situation. And, and so he, there you see him taking food to this elderly woman, yeah. as many other pastors do. Yeah. Let me go and here and ending with Adriana, um, who actually served her internship in your church, I know, and you got to know her well. And as Carlos said, this is one of the largest um, churches of the of the uh, of the Independent Presbyterian Church of Santo Espiritus, and um, she is there and also has responsibility for two mission 
churches. So not fully organized churches. That's what the church, what the um, Cuban church means, but they are places often mission churches will develop into full blown churches. So um, it's wonderful to see the trajectory, but tell us a little bit about Adriana because she's a, kind of a special woman. Well, yes, I already mentioned that she's already ordained. Uh, she is. She struggles quite a bit as a as a single mother currently, uh, uh, far away from her family. Her family lives here in in Matanzas, uh, but she's doing a great job. I mean, as I mentioned, it's one of the biggest churches. Uh, normally, a seminary uh, uh, a graduate of our seminary would go to a small church and to develop their skills there. But because of the need of pastors we have in Cuba, she was, and because of her trajectory already as a very mature person, uh, she was called directly by this big church. Mm -hmm. She's doing well, she's very happy. And she also sends her greetings and, and her appreciation for the support. Wonderful. Carlos, um, a couple of, I'm kind of looking at some of the questions and one of them that I think is a very important one that I'd love for you to, to reflect upon. I mean, we know that the United States has had um, long troubled relationships with Cuba that had gotten to a great improvement under um, President Obama. And then a lot of those, a lot of those relations were rolled back under President Trump, and now we hope are going to return to normalization. But um, Ralph, who's uh, on our staff and who has been there with us, has uh, this question for you. What, what is your outlook for US-Cuba relations improving to the point where commerce, tourism, short-term mission trips resume? And a lot of that I know is dependent upon COVID, but specifically the relationship between our nations. Are you hopeful of what can yet heal and move forward? Yes, yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think before answering that question or part of the answer would, would be to say that uh, the Cuban revolution, which is more than 60 years old already, we have uh, related, so to say, to I think uh, eight different US administrations, different presidents. So we have had a lot of ups and downs uh, uh, but in spite of the big political differences between our two governments, I think it's very important to say and to recognize with appreciation the ro role that the churches have played, uh, th that I call playing a pontifical role of building bridges on top of the hostilities between both governments. No, And, and we appreciate very much that the Outreach Foundation has been part of that minist pontifical ministry of building bridges of love, reconciliation, and mutual uh, understanding. Even during the most difficult time, which is in the former Trump administration, uh, the churches played a very important role to, to keep both nations together and to recognize that we all belong to the same church, the same body of Christ. Now, to answer that question, I would say it's a bit difficult still when, when people have asked the current Biden administration about the relationships with Cuba, he has <clears throat> answered that Cuba is not a priority for his administration, which can have two different readings, no? One reading is that, well, if it's not a priority, we hope that situation won't get worse. But it, the other reading is that we cannot expect for it to improve in the next future. In his presidential campaign, he said that he was going to reestablish the remittances of the relatives to Cuba, the flights, etc. But now, as we speak, the the um, the situation is a bit in a standstill. One of the good news is, is that even during the administration, um, the church relationships of bringing groups down to Cuba was never interrupted. So if that was the case in the worst case scenario, which is 
during the Trump administration, um, we are very hopeful that as soon as uh, COVID allows us, flights are going to re, uh, resume and therefore we will be able to receive uh, your groups. We'll be, we'll um, be during the Trump, soon as during we the Trump administration, the, the, uh, the US embassy was virtually closed which means that all the Cubans that wanted to apply for visas, American visas had to travel to third countries. Those are the things that we're hoping are going to improve with Biden's administration, that the consulate is gonna open again and manage to apply for visas, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't see that in the next future. Sometime we would have to expect to wait a bit for a bit more time. We will pray and work for that. Carlos, um, Kelly tells me that she's gotten some direct questions, um, that a couple of which she thinks she, we need to hear. So Kelly, what, what, what are some of the questions within the last four minutes that we have here that we, Carlos or I might answer? Okay, um, just got a couple of quick questions. So one is, um, to what degree are American visitors able to stay in touch with the Cuban churches, pastors, or church members that they might get to know while they're there on a trip? How and the quick answer to that is easy now because there is much greater improvement with the uh, communication, with the internet. I mean, as you see, Carlos is on a Zoom call and those kinds of communication are now pretty regular. It used to be difficult um, because of, of lack of Wi-Fi. Now that is becoming much easier and better facilitated. Great. You provided a better answer that I could have. Thank you, Marilyn. What else, Kelly? Um, the one other question that I had, uh, Nancy wanted to know, how is COVID affecting the life of the church in Cuba? Please, Carlos. Okay, um, well, first of all, it, it is affecting tremendously our whole population. Um, although we are, our Cuban uh, health uh, authorities are in the process of um, testing five different vaccines. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping that before the end of the year, like many of you, we will be, we will be able to get our, our shots. Uh, the, the COVID is affecting the church in Cuba in the sense that many social um, gatherings have been closed by the authorities uh, precisely to avoid the transmitting of the viruses. That means that the Cuban sanctuaries have been closed, I don't know, for perhaps uh, two or three months already. So we are struggling very hard, even when we cannot meet physically, to keep in touch as a church through the internet. Marilyn said that we have more uh, access to the internet, more affordable and safer, uh, through prayer, through telephone calls. But we are eager uh, to, to, to arrive to the time in which we no longer have the, the COVID in order to embrace each other and Marilyn and those of you that can, have come to Cuba, you know, we embrace each other and we like to kiss each other very physically, very strongly. No, and that is something that we're missing and we are hoping that we will be able to, to resume when our sanctuaries are open again. We will, we will be there for those hugs and those embraces and the awkward dancing that we do as Americans that you Cubans do so easily. Friends, we are out of time and um, we really want to be sensitive because many of you are on your work breaks or on your lunch breaks. If there are questions that you have that you have a burning um, desire for an answer to that we haven't covered, please just send a, an email directly to me, Marilyn, at theoutreachfoundation.org and we'll get it answered. You can also so do that to our website, but very grateful for those of you who have gathered, many of you, as I said, um, have traveled with us before. Jeff McDonald, I see you're smiling.
smiling face there. Um, many of you have traveled with us. Many of your churches have supported both the seminary and the IPRC in Cuba during the long journey of the church there, and particularly during this difficult time. Many of you have done that personally as well. If you want to know more about, about how Outreach Foundation partners with and ministers alongside the church in Cuba, please contact the Outreach Foundation and we're happy to get you going. We don't yet have a trip planned, but stay tuned on our website. As soon as we're able to do that, we have a trips tab that you can see the places that Outreach Foundation longs to go to as we live into the words of the Apostle Paul. I long to see you that I may impart to you a spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. Carlos, we're grateful for you, for your presence. We are mutually encouraged by your faith personally, by the faith of the church in Cuba. And I am going to send us off with a prayer as we close this recording and ask you to stay tuned for other third Thursday treks. This will be the last one. We'll put a pause on this. And part of that is I'm getting back on the road again next month and headed to Lebanon. And so that is a, a good sign that the world is starting to open up. But let me, let me say a blessing prayer. Father, we come to you on this day, each day a gift we no longer take for granted. And we ask for your blessing upon your church all over the world, but particularly we ask for your church on that island just to the south of us, our neighbors, that is the island of Cuba. We thank you for the faithful work and witness, the faithful mission and ministry, the exuberant expression of faith, often under difficult circumstances, that has been your church in Cuba. So we ask you to continue to bless them, to nurture them, to continue to provide resources to them through us for the work that you have called them to. And if it be your will to bring us back together as the body of faith, as we are committed to your son, Jesus Christ, in whose precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Friend, thank you, Carlos, bless you. And we look forward to being all together in some way, shape or form as God calls us. So thank you all. Have a blessed remainder to your day. Thank Marilyn. you, Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you.